Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to what I believe is the sixth annual um, John uh, Gedded Lecture Series. Uh, the series is in honor of John Gedded, the founding vice dean of the Harrisburg campus, the first faculty member on the Harrisburg campus, um, and the mentor of so many of us. When I was thinking, when I, they said, uh, do the welcome and say a few words about John, I was thinking, okay, what's my relationship with John? John was the first person I ever spoke to from Widener, because I interviewed with John Gedded at the hiring conference. He's the one who convinced me to come out and check the place out to uh, um, maybe join the faculty. He was one of the people who convinced me to join the faculty. He twice got me into the dean's office. <laughs> so much of what I have done, <laughs> I have John Gedded to thank. And that's really what this series recognizes, that John's role, um, I was once a young law professor, uh, but John's role as a mentor in many, many ways to the um, students, to new faculty, to our alumni. And that's why the school has been recognizing John with this lecture series for six years. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Jill Family, our d director of the Law and Government Institute, and John's successor in that role. Thank you, Robin, and thank you all so much for um, coming here this afternoon. It's so great to see so many familiar faces and students and alums, um, and I'm really glad you're all here. Um, I'm just going to say a few words and then I'll introduce our speaker, Catherine Watts. I just wanted to remind you that after the presentation, um, we have a reception in our reception room, you just sort of head left out of this room, which you're more than welcome uh, to attend. And there will be um, some time for questions at the end of Catherine's, uh, Professor Watts's talk, um, if you have uh, questions. Um, so I just want to say a few words about uh, John Gedded, Professor Gedded. I um, met John Gedded nine years ago already when I was interviewing um, to, to work at Widener. And I remember, he probably doesn't remember this, but I remember at my interview, he told me, so we have this thing called the Law and Government Institute. And I remember at the, from the minute he told me about that, I was very interested. Um, the Law and Government Institute here at Widener is a really great resource that takes advantage of uh, Widener Harrisburg's position in the state capitol and um, allows students to concentrate their legal studies in government law and we also put on all sorts of programming um, that addresses issues and topics related uh, to government law. And so it really is a great honor for me, you know, not only to be here and to try to begin to fill John's very large shoes as the director of the Law and Government Institute, um, but even sweeter to be able um, to participate in this lecture where we honor uh, Professor Geddes' work um, and his commitment to Widener. So one of the things that we do is, um, Every year, uh, for every lecture, this is a yearly lecture that we have here at Widener, we have the speaker um, sign their um, little promotional flyer, and we give this book back to John every year so that he can keep a running record of all the fabulous speakers we've had come as a part of this. And the idea behind the lecture is that um, we bring in an academic who is in the earlier part of their career, who already you know, has a, a sort of stellar national or international reputation, um, but in the spirit of John Gedded's mentorship of uh, newer academics who can come and give this um, lecture. So I would love, it's my great honor to present this book um, back to John Gedded. And then, of course, um, it is also my honor to recognize um, Professor Geddes' wife, Carol, um, who always comes to these events, and we're always so happy to see her, and we appreciate her support of, as Widener as well. So we have a um, small token of spring to recognize uh, her commitment to Widener as well. Thank you. 
And now it is my um, great pleasure to introduce to you our, our lecturer for today, um, Professor Catherine Watts um, from the University of Washington School of Law. Kath Professor Watts teaches administrative law, constitutional law, and Supreme Court decision making. She has recently served as Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development at the University of Washington School of Law. And she was recently selected to serve as the Garvey Schubert Bearer Professor of Law. Her scholarship has been published in a variety of top journals, including the Yale Law Journal, the Harvard Law Review, the Duke Law Journal, the University of Pennsylvania Law Review, and the Northwestern University Law Review. In addition, she is a two-time recipient of the Philip A. Trotman Professor of the Year Award given by the student body at the University of Washington. Professor Watts earned her JD summa cum laude from Northwestern University School of Law, where she earned the John Paul Stevens Prize for Academic Excellence for graduating first in her class. Professor Watts clerked for Judge A. Raymond Randolph of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and Justice John Paul Stevens of the U.S. Supreme Court. It's been a pleasure for me to get to know uh, Professor Watts um, as we've both been serving as council members uh, to the administrative law section of the American Bar Association. She is an accomplished scholar, a fabulous teacher, a wonderful speaker, and perhaps most importantly, she's also a wonderful person and a fabulous colleague. So please join me in welcoming Professor Catherine Watts. Thanks so much, Jill, and thanks so much to all of you. It's really my pleasure to be here today and to have the opportunity to give the sixth John um, Gedded Lecture here at Widener University. I was especially honored that Jill family thought to recommend me for this lecture since I have gotten to know Jill well over the past couple of years through our work on the ABA's administrative law section, and I think very highly of, of Jill. So thank you, Professor Gedded. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Jill. Thank you to all of you um, very much for so warmly welcoming me here. So my job today is to talk, and your job is to listen. The hope is that I finish my job before you finish yours. <laughs> to help me along with that task, I decided to talk today about a topic that I think all in the room will find fairly easily accessible and interesting. Specifically, I'm going to base my talk on an article that I published this past fall in the NYU Law Review called Judges and Their Papers. The title of the article hopefully gives away a little bit of what I'm talking about. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about federal judges' working papers. And working papers essentially are simply just chambers papers, internal confidential papers created by federal judges in the course of doing their job. So these papers might be created by the federal judges or their law clerks um, when they are actually deciding a case and drafting opinions. So the federal papers might include draft opinions from behind the scenes, might include conference memorandum, might include interchambers memorandum, might include vote sheets. And these working papers that I'll be talking about today, of course, are distinct from the official record in a case. The official record, which often includes publicly accessible materials like judicial opinions, um, orders, transcripts. That's distinct from what we'll be talking about here. So judges and their law clerks create many, many working papers in the course of deciding cases, both in hard copy and increasingly today in electronic format. And I want to start out by giving you just three concrete examples up on the slide so that you can think of illustrations of what judges' papers might look like as I start my talk about them today. The, the first example I want to give you, and don't worry that you can't read the details on them, what I want you to see is the handwriting, to get a flavor of. I'm giving you these slides as an artifact, an illustration of judges' papers. This is um, a relatively routine example of a vote sheet from the United States Supreme Court in a case that many law students in the room probably recognize. How many law students recognize South Dakota versus Dole? Uh, a, an important constitutional law case involving conditional spending. On this, you can see little tiny check marks in handwriting. That's the only thing I want you to be able to notice there. And what that's indicating is the justices behind the scenes votes at both the cert stage, when the court is deciding whether or not it wants to hear the case, and at the merit stage. These votes at the cert stage are not generally disclosed to the public. The court does not disclose how the justices vote behind the scenes on whether or not to take cases. So how is it that I have this vote sheet here up on the slide for you? 
Well, it was found after Justice Blackmun died. Justice Blackmun chose to donate his working papers to the Library of Congress and to allow them to be opened to the public five years after his death. So that's how we find this particular example of a judge's working paper. The second example of what a judge's working paper might look like can be seen here. Again, just simply note, it looks like a typewritten sheet of paper. But see the little check marks, the underlines, the annotations on it. Those annotations were done by someone in Justice Blackman's chambers. This annotated markup includes this language. From this day forward, I shall no longer tinker with the machinery of death. Might sound familiar, that line, to some of you. That comes from a famous opinion written by Justice Blackman in a case called Callens versus Collins in 1994. In this case, Justice Blackman expressed his view that he reached, after years of struggling with the death penalty, that the death penalty just simply wasn't constitutional. What's interesting about this particular paper that I show you up on the slide that includes this language is it is part of other behind-the-scenes confidential drafts that researchers found after his papers were open to the public that showed us that Justice Blackman actually had started working on this opinion long before the Callens case. So he had formed his view that the death penalty was no longer constitutional and worked on the draft and waited for the proper vehicle to come before the court before issuing this now famous language from Justice Blackman. So that's the second example of what a judge's paper might look like. The third and last just initial example I'll give you to set the stage, this is a 1952 memo that was written to Justice Jackson at the Supreme Court and it was written as you can see at the very bottom, there's a little tiny three letters and it says WHR. Who do you think the WHR was? Right, William H. Rehnquist wrote this memo. And this is what the memo says. I've now pulled out for you the language of it. It says, I realize it's an unpopular and unhumanitarian position for which I have been excoriated by liberal colleagues, but I think Plessy versus Ferguson was right and should be reaffirmed. This is language that Rehnquist wrote to his boss, to Justice Jackson, when the court was deciding Brown versus Board of Education, the great school desegregation case. This language, of course, later came back to haunt Rehnquist during his own judicial confirmation proceedings. So these three examples, this 1952 memo written by, at the time, just a law clerk, later to become Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Blackman's dissent in the Callan's death penalty case, and the relatively routine vote sheet in South Dakota versus Dole, those are just three of the many, many different examples of the huge paper trail that federal judges create behind the scenes day to day while doing their jobs. This paper trail can include rather juicy and tantalizing tidbits about the federal courts and about the judges who serve on the federal courts, but it also can ex include extremely valuable historical information, culturally and historically significant information, giving us insights into our country's judicial history, broader history, and the decision-making process of the judges who sit on our federal courts. So the question that my paper addressed and that I want to focus on in my talk today is, who should own these types of federal papers? Papers created by federal judges. Who should own these? Whose property should these papers be? This question of ownership has rarely been asked in our country's history. Instead, throughout our country's history, we have simply accepted the notion that the justices of the United States Supreme Court and federal judges own their own working papers. So what this means is that justices and judges can do whatever they please with these sorts of papers, whether that means burning or shredding them, which has happened on many occasions, whether that means um, donating them to a library, like the Library of Congress, for release to the public, or whether it means doing nothing with them, which means the default is they go to the judges or justices' heirs where they are often lost or scattered in the hands of heirs and family members. So in short, there is no uniform rule that governs or regulates federal judges' working papers, other than our long-standing historical default, which gives judges ownership and control over their own papers. So what I'm going to argue today is that this historical default is quite problematic, and that as a normative matter, judicial papers should be treated as governmental property, not private property, just like presidential papers are today as a result of the Presidential Records Act of 1978 that was passed in the wake of the Nixon scandal. The gist of my reasoning is that judicial papers are created by governmental officials, judges, using governmental resources while carrying out official governmental functions and duties. And hence, they are governmental, not private in nature, 
despite our longstanding tradition of private ownership. As I'll discuss with you today, I recognize that declaring judicial papers to be public rather than private could raise some really tricky separation of powers questions, given that we are talking about the judicial branch, and it could potentially threaten the judiciary's independence. So I will argue that rather than setting forth precise rules for judicial papers, Congress should merely declare judicial papers to be governmental property and should then leave the rest to the hands of the judiciary, empowering the judiciary through the Judicial Conference of the United States to promulgate its own specific rules governing the specifics of things like access to and disposition of the papers. These rules might speak to things like the timing of release of judicial papers. By involving the judiciary in implementing a shift to public ownership, to governmental ownership, I believe Congress would enhance the likelihood of judicial cooperation, help mitigate separation of powers concerns, and help enable the judiciary to craft rules aimed at safeguarding things like judicial independence, collegiality, and confidentiality. So now, before I dive more into the real heart of and the specifics of my argument, I want to just step back for one more moment to let you know why it was that I became interested in judicial papers in the first place. Much of my writing has to do with the heart of administrative law. Much of my writing has to do with Chevron deference and other sorts of um, weighty and meaty, right, administrative law issues. Um, so I got interested in judicial papers because I recently co-authored a book for use in Supreme Court decision-making classes, another course that I teach at University of Washington. The book is called The Supreme Court Source Book. The cover is shown there on the slide, and just by happenstance, it was published um, by Walters Kluwer by Aspen, which I understand is one of the sponsors of today's, um, today's event, so I was pleased to see that. Um, so the book just came out this last spring, and what my co-authors and I aim to do in this book is we aim to teach students and just other readers who want to know more about the court we, we aim to teach, how does the court go about doing its job? How does the Supreme Court operate? How does it decide cases? And we felt like the best way to do that, three of us are former Supreme Court clerks, the best way to do that was to show readers actual examples of papers from behind the court that actually illustrate the process of judicial drafting of opinions behind the scenes, the process of deciding which cases to decide via the cert pool mechanism, for example. And so we filled our book with various examples that helped illustrate how the court actually does its job, various examples of judicial papers. This is one of them. Again, you don't have to be able to read the specifics on there, just note all of the handwriting on there. This is a well-marked up cert pool memo. How many in the room cert pool memo? Greek? Never heard it? There's a few, right, who haven't heard the term cert pool memo. Cert pool memo is written by a law clerk at the Supreme Court. What the Supreme Court does, today, for example, it might get 8,000 cert petitions in a year. Lots of cert petitions to go through and decide which few, which chosen few, which 70 or 80 will they actually hear on the merits. That's a, that's a very resource intensive job. So the court tasks one law clerk out of all of the chambers. The chambers pool their law clerks together, and one law clerk is tasked with writing what's called the cert pool memo in each, um, for each cert pool petition, recommending whether the court should grant or deny or take some other action on a particular case. The justices, of course, are not obligated at all to follow what the law clerks recommend. It's merely a judicial clerk's recommendation. This cert pool memo is written in the famous case or infamous case Bowers versus Hardwick, a case I'm sure all of you in the room have heard of before, involving a Georgia law that criminalized sodomy. In this cert pool memo, at the top, the handwriting at the top is written by Justice, Justice Powell. And the handwriting at the bottom, signed Bill, is written by Justice Powell's law clerks. Both of them behind the scenes are struggling with what to do with the case. Should the court grant? Should the court deny? And you see Justice Powell and his law clerk thinking about it slightly differently here and thinking about it slightly differently than the law clerk. Well, what better way to teach students about how the court goes about deciding which cases to decide than showing these sorts of examples where the court is struggling with what to do in particular cases. So this is one of the examples we include in our chapter on certiorari. We also include various examples like this from Miranda versus Arizona to help illustrate to readers of our book how the court actually writes its judicial opinions, how things are changed. This illustrates a particular change in the Miranda case where an original sentence in a draft of the opinion read, in a series of cases decided by this court long after these studies, Negro defendants were subjected to physical brutality, beatings, hanging, whipping, employed to extort confessions. So it, the behind the scenes papers illustrate 
that Justice Brennan expressed discomfort with this type of language. He expressed discomfort with casting the problem with custodial interrogations in racial terms. So a law clerk in Warren's chambers, in this handwritten scrawl that's on the margins, changed that language, took out the racial references, and rewrote it, and those rewritten lines appear in the final opinion, which reads, in a series of cases decided by this court long ago after these studies, the police resorted to physical brutality, beating, hanging, whipping, and to sustained and protracted questioning incommunicado in order to extort confessions. This kind of behind the scenes back and forth between the justices you can find in these judges' papers and is a wonderful way to illustrate to students of the court how it is that the court goes about deciding cases. Since our book relies so heavily on these sorts of judges' papers, we wanted to include in the last section of our book, which has to do with the court and the public eye, an explanation of how it is that the public, that we all, gain access to these sorts of papers. And when I came to write that section, which was tasked to me, I was very surprised to learn that unlike presidential papers, very little attention throughout history has been given by, legislatures, by, by legislators, by scholars, or by judges to the topic of who should own federal judges' working papers. And I was also surprised to learn that our treatment of judicial papers diverges from our country's treatment of presidential papers, thus leaving the fate of judicial papers up to the hands of individual judges. So that is what brought me to this project in the first place. So with that bit of background as to how I got interested, let me now dive into the heart of my argument that I told you I was going to make today. So there's four main parts to to what I want to discuss with you today. The first is a brief description of our longstanding tradition of private ownership of judges' papers. I want to talk a bit about that, why it came about. We don't know why, but I can speculate. And talk about the consequences of that longstanding history. Then I would like to describe to you what I see as the two major problems or flaws with our current private ownership model governing judicial papers. I'll then set forth my own proposal for how we might move to a public ownership model and then I'll conclude by acknowledging four, although there are many, of the major counter arguments that could be raised against a move to a public ownership model for judicial papers. So first, the long-standing tradition of private ownership. This emerged in the very beginning of our country's history. From the very beginning, the justices of the Supreme Court and federal judges treated their papers as private property, protected by and alienable by the rules of private property. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly where this tradition came from or why it emerged, but there are a variety of different plausible explanations. Chief among these is simply the fact that there was a lack of governmental repositories that could accept judges' papers, president's papers, or any other governmental papers for that matter. Tellingly, I think, um, I read in one book that President Benjamin Harrison, who served as president from 18, 1889 to 1893, asserted in his will that he wanted to leave his papers to a historical society where they could be kept together safely, but no suitable place or organization was then available, so he feared that they would have to be divided between his wife and children. The manuscript division of the Library of Congress wasn't established until 1897. The National Archives not founded until 1934. And the records profession, too, is a relatively new phenomenon in this country. Indeed, something that, as simple as the wooden file box that we all take for granted, it did not emerge in records offices throughout the country until the Civil War. And when it did emerge, it was viewed as a revolution. So I think that is probably one of the biggest explanations for why judges' papers were initially viewed as private, is there just was really no other place for them to go but in individual hands. Another possible explanation is simply that judges may have followed the lead of the other branches. In particular, in the White House, we had President George Washington set the lead. He took his papers with him to Mount Vernon when he left the presidency, and he later left his papers to his nephew, Associate Justice Bushrod Washington. Jonathan Turley, um, another um, legal scholar, has explained in an article on presidential papers that this tradition of private ownership of presidential papers may have been influenced by Locke's labor theory, that the creator should be rewarded for his labor. So it may be that judges just simply followed president's lead, and that's why we ended up with the private ownership model. There's also some court-specific explanations. Um, one of them might have to do with the fact that courts operate as courts of record, given that there is a fairly weighty record, official record, created in cases, judges may have simply felt it wasn't worth preserving or not um, proper to preserve other records in any official capacity. 
And then finally, I think another possible explanation has to do with the tradition of secrecy that surrounds our courts and tradition of independence that surrounds our courts. This has its roots, of course, with Chief Justice John Marshall. Um, he, for example, wanted the court to speak through one official single voice rather than through seriatim opinions. And this could have led the court to think about its uh, to think about wanting to uh, speak with one voice and hence not wanting to collect a bunch of other voices that might be extraneous. Um, and so they may have felt that judges' papers weren't worth preservation for that reason. So we don't know quite why, but I think these are possible explanations for our current model of private ownership. So the consequences of that, that's what's interesting to me. The consequences is that because of this private ownership model that's emerged, judicial papers are handled in an ad hoc manner, on a judge to judge basis. And this means that we see a real dizzying array of approaches when it comes to how each individual judge or justice chooses to handle his or her own papers. With respect to lower federal court judges, many lower, for, lower federal court judges' papers are simply lost or scattered or destroyed. This is likely attributable to the fact that judges face the burden, the financial burden, resource intensive burden of preserving their papers if they wish to do so. No federal court funds are available for that job and federal record centers do not provide storage of judges' chambers papers. Often what this means is that a judge dies while in office, the papers go to the heir who might be downsizing to a smaller apartment and the papers simply get lost or scattered. So for lower federal court judges, we do have some examples of great uh, history of preservation for a few, but for most, those papers have not been preserved. With respect to the Supreme Court, the record is a bit different. Up until the 20th century, relatively few justices' papers were preserved. But when we get um, to the 20th century, the record of preservation improves quite a bit. It still, though, was quite spotty, and it still is quite spotty and inconsistent. So as one example, consider Justice White. The cover shown up there is a book about Justice White written by Dennis Hutchinson. Dennis Hutchinson wrote in this biography of Justice White that when Justice White had 25 years of accumulated case files in his chambers, he decided it was time to clean up the place. So he purchased a shredder just for the occasion and he and his law clerk spent successive weekends sending files through the paper shredder. One law clerk, this is according to Hutchinson, who had academic ambitions, recalls vividly putting one file after another marked Miranda v. Arizona through the shredder and thinking, well, here's an article, here's an entire book. I couldn't believe how much history was going down the chute. Other members of the 20th century court to destroy all or nearly all of their papers include Justices Owen Roberts, Joseph McKenna, George Sutherland, Benjamin Cardozo, and the list goes on. Fortunately, though, for history's sake, at least, there are others who have chosen to preserve their papers. Among them recently are Justices Thurgood Marshall, William Brennan, Lewis Powell, Harry Blackman, William Rehnquist, David Souter, and Sandra Day O'Connor. However, even these justices that have opted for preservation have diverged dramatically when it comes to when to release their papers, how long of a time um, lag there will be, where their papers shall be placed, public or private repository, and who they shall be made available to, only a particular favored scholar or the public at large. So for example, upon his retirement in 2009, Justice David Souter announced he would donate his papers, he would make them publicly accessible, but does anybody know in the room where you would have to go to find them? New Hampshire, I heard. <laughs> you have to go to New Hampshire and you have to wait until 2059. I, for one, will be in my 80s then, and I look forward to a trip maybe in the fall when the leaves are turning to get to go, right, to New Hampshire and see Justice Souter's papers. But that's a long way off. As another example of a significant time lag, think of um, Berger. Justice Berger's son left Berger's papers to, the William, to William and Mary, but they will not be opened until 2026. They were given to William and Mary back in 1996 by his son. So another long time lag. In contrast, consider Justice Thurgood Marshall. Justice Marshall, in what turned out to be a very controversial, controversial move, he donated his papers to the Library of Congress. And the Library of Congress did something that enraged the members of the Supreme Court. It opened the papers immediately upon his death, which happened to be just two years after he left the court. 
So his papers were released just two years after he left the court when the other justices who he'd sat with were all still there and were deciding the same types of controversial issues that had been decided when Marshall was on the court and that his files reflected upon. His papers consisted of 173,000 items spanning Marshall's 24-year career on the court, and they revealed a wealth of information about cases only very recently decided by the court, and also about other justices who were still sitting on the court. Justice Marshall's papers, for instance, revealed that the court had come so close to overruling its seminal abortion precedent of Roe versus Wade in 1989 that three justices had already drafted an angry dissent. His papers also showed that the court's 1989 decision, striking down laws prohibiting flag burning, came right down to the wire and ultimately rested in the hands of Justice Harry Blackman, who cast the determinative vote just two days before the opinion was issued. Given the really short time period, that two-year time period, it's not that surprising that people like Chief Justice Rehnquist, who's highlighted in this newspaper account, objected. Rehnquist wrote, according to this news article, an angry letter on behalf of a majority of the Supreme Court, and he accused the Library of Congress of bad judgment in releasing the papers of Justice Thurgood Marshall so soon after his death, and he warned that other justices might no longer donate their papers to the library. Well, what did the Library of Congress do in response? It said, we're simply honoring the donor's wishes. He said, release them upon my death. He didn't know when he would die. Once he died, we released them. So that's how they responded. So these various examples, and I could go on with many more examples of how other recent justices have handled their papers, should at least illustrate to you that there is no uniform way the papers are handled. It is very ad hoc. Might be preserved, might be destroyed, might be lost. In my mind, this ad hoc treatment is problematic and it needs to change. It's ill-advised in my mind for at least two main reasons. The first reason that I think it's ill-advised is it puts our treatment of judicial papers at odds with how we treat presidential papers. As I already alluded to, early on, presidential papers were viewed as private property. In fact, Congress appropriated funds early on for the government to purchase presidential papers. Papers, for example, some from George Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and James Monroe. Our country's treatment of presidential papers changed, though, changed very dramatically in the 1970s in the wake of the Nixon scandal. The most important development in this respect, with respect to presidential papers, came in the wake of Nixon's resignation in 1974. Questions arose about whether Nixon could take with him documents and tape recordings that he had accumulated while in office, his own presidential papers, despite the Watergate, Watergate special prosecutor's need for access to the materials. Ultimately, Congress weighed in on the matter by passing the Presidential Recordings and Materials Preservation Act of 1974, the PRMPA. It did two things of note for my talk today. First, it, titled, it, it targeted Nixon's papers, specifically providing that the administrator of the general services was to seize and retain possession of the tape recordings and other Nixon papers accumulated during his administration. Second, this is the most interesting thing for purposes of my talk today, Title II of the Act created a National Study Commission on Records and Documents of Federal Officials, which I'll refer to as the Commission. It was charged with studying and making recommendations about appropriate legislation in the area of government records. The thinking in forming this governmental commission was that the nation had suffered too long from an absence of clear and definite policy when it came to the treatment of all federal papers, not just presidential papers or judges' papers, and that a national study commission was needed to help recommend a better path forward. So this commission was um, made up of 17 different members. High-level members, you had a federal judge, you had senators, you had history professors, you had archivists who sat on this 17-member commission. They, after doing lots of research, holding lots of hearings, issued a very lengthy report in 1977. And although they couldn't agree on all of the details, the central thing that they did all agree upon was that all federal records, whether presidential papers, judicial papers, or the papers of individual congressmen, should all be treated as governmental property, not private property. After the commission's report was released, Congress did react. It took action. But it did so only with respect to presidential papers. It did nothing with respect to the commission's recommendations about congressional records or judicial records. So it reacted by passing the Presidential Records Act of 1978, 
which terminated the long-standing notion of private ownership of presidential papers. Legislative history, unfortunately, I've gone through it many times, and I wish it shed light on why Congress didn't respond to the portions revolving judicial papers or congressional papers, but it doesn't give us much more than a few hints. Perhaps the explanation is that Congress wanted to give the judiciary a chance to act on its own first, in order to show respect to the judiciary as a coordinate branch of government, or in order to avoid potential separation of powers problems. Or perhaps Congress, in the wake of the Nixon mess, was just so fixated on solving the problem of presidential papers, since that was what it was at issue in the Nixon mess, that it dealt with that, and it just didn't think about or deal with the others. It wanted to deal with the burning issue at hand. Regardless, the result is that in the end, Congress did shift our, mo our model for presidential papers to public governmental ownership. Now, of course, this mere fact that presidential papers are now public and judicial papers are not, that mere fact alone should not convince me that we must, too, move judicial papers towards a public model because the role of president and the role of judge is very, very different, as we would all acknowledge. For example, the president is elected by the people and is, of course, subjected to political accountability and oversight, whereas members of the federal judiciary, by constitutional design, are granted a, a great degree of insulation and independence from political and popular control due to their lifetime tenure and salary protections. In my mind, though, none of, of these or other differences between president and judge counsel against public ownership of judges' papers, given that judicial papers, like presidential papers, are created by governmental officials in the course of official governmental duties using governmental resources and governmental facilities. The National Study Commission of 1977 recognized as much. That commission said, as is the case with the public papers of presidents and members of Congress, the public papers of federal judges are created in the course of doing the public's business, using government facilities and at public expense. The commission can find no distinctions that would modify its conclusion that all such materials should be the property of the United States. So this is not to say that differences between president and judge, including the judiciary's very important constitutional independence, are irrelevant. I believe they are relevant, but they are relevant when it comes to setting terms of access to and disposition of judicial papers, such as rules governing when judicial papers should be opened. I don't believe, though, when it comes to the threshold question of ownership, that differences between judges and president are relevant in terms of counseling against public ownership for both branches' papers. So that's my first reason to question our private ownership model. The second is that, in my mind, the private ownership model has not well balanced the many competing interests that surround judicial papers. When it comes to preservation and disclosure and access to judges' papers, there are many, many different competing stakes at play. On the one hand, tipping in favor of preservation and in favor of some kind of access, we have weighty historical interests, learning about the history of the judiciary's decision-making process, the history of individuals who have served in the judiciary, the history behind cases and major social movements, and the history of the judiciary's relationship to society as a whole. In addition to these historical and cultural interests, judges' papers can also help to promote important governmental accountability interests, oversight, transparency. Judges' papers, in other words, can help enable judges to be judged at some point in history, even if they enjoy independence while in office. Yet counseling against access to judges' papers or counseling in favor of very restricted access to judicial papers, we have concerns about protecting the litigants and finality of judgments issued by courts, as well as real serious concerns about protecting the judiciary's own collegiality, confidentiality, um, and also concerns about chilling effects that might be created for judicial members if they know that their papers are to be disclosed. So these are many competing interests that are moving us in opposite directions. And a major problem with private ownership is that it fails to balance these many competing interests in any kind of concerted or coordinated manner. Take, for example, Justice Souter's decision to release his papers, but not until 2059. That certainly represents his own attempt at balancing these many competing interests and his own attempt to ensure that the historical information is someday available, but isn't available too, too prematurely such that it would harm the judiciary's independence um, or create chilling effects or otherwise damage um, notions of confidentiality. 
His decision, though, doesn't necessarily represent what's in the best interests of the public at large because it's his own calculation of these competing interests. Similarly, Justice Thurgood Marshall's decision to release his papers immediately upon his death, which happened to be just two years after he left the bench, represented just his own calculation of how to mediate these competing interests. His decision certainly was not shared by a majority of the court or by Chief Justice Rehnquist, as I showed you on an earlier slide, who voiced significant um, unease with the treatment of Marshall's papers. So put simply, our current model is just not doing a good job of mediating all of these competing interests. And this seems quite problematic to me when you consider that many of the competing interests involve stakes that are much broader than any one judge or any one justice. Many of the interests at stake that are shown here on the slide go to the very heart of the judiciary's institutional integrity and independence, as well as to the public's broad interests in preserving history and holding our government accountable. So given what I see as these two flaws in our current private ownership model, in the paper that I'm talking with you about today, I've set forth the argument that our country should consider shifting to a public ownership model. And in trying to bring about such a change, the first question that I think we would have to sort through is, well, who is the best body to make that change? Is it through congressional legislation, or is it for the courts, for the courts to bring about this change? My own view is that threshold question of ownership has to be decided by Congress. This is because overriding the longstanding tradition of private ownership and declaring what is now private property to become public property would seem to constitute a legislative act and one that might well raise takings concerns if applied retroactively. So it seems the threshold ownership question needs to be decided by Congress. If Congress were to act, I would recommend, however, that it act in a very open-ended manner, perhaps something along these lines, something to the effect of, the United States shall reserve and retain complete ownership, possession, and control of judicial records, including draft opinions, internal correspondence, and vote sheets created and retained in chambers files by federal judges and Supreme Court justices in the course of deciding such official judicial matters and cases. Such judicial records shall be administered and made reasonably accessible to the public in accordance with regulations promulgated by the Judicial Conference of the United States. Such regulations shall seek to serve the public interest and to provide uniform regulations to govern judicial records. So what would such kind of mushy wording do? Well. It certainly wouldn't force judges to create any particular records in the first instance, which would probably raise separation of powers questions if it did, nor would it necessarily force judges to retain any papers, since a judge could conceivably choose to discard certain records in chambers files so that they weren't in the chambers files, so long as this practice was consistent with regulations promulgated by the Judicial Conference. So what would the contribution be? In my mind, the main contribution of legislation along these broad lines would be to declare public ownership and to prompt the judiciary to act, to prompt the judiciary to take some action so that we get some uniformity rather than our current completely ad hoc approach that we have today. And such legislation would empower the judiciary to sort through by its own, on its own, the myriad of different details that would need to be addressed. For example, definitional terms. What papers should be covered? Should papers of federal district court judges be di treated differently than court of appeals judges versus Supreme Court justices, for example? What needs to be retained and kept? There's also access terms. For example, if access is to be granted publicly, when should it be granted? Should it be 10 years after a judge or justice leaves office? 10, 15, 20 years after a judge or justice dies? Should it be 20 years after all of the members of the court that sat with that other judge or justice died? We currently have the gamut, right, with individual judges and justices calls with this respect, and here the judiciary could set one uniform rule. There would also be questions about disposition. Should the papers be required to be deposited in a public institution, a public repository like the Library of Congress, or would it be permissible to deposit them in a private institution, for example, Stanford University, um, which Rehnquist chose to leave his papers with. One benefit of private might be that it would help spread the financial costs to more than just onto the public, um, public shoulders. There's a variety of reasons why I think giving the judiciary the power to sort through these issues on its own makes sense. The first is judicial compliance. If Congress tried to dictate to the judiciary with, sp sp with um, detailed precision, the courts could always just thumb their nose back at Congress, right? So it's in 
Congress's best interest to give the judiciary a significant role in filling up the details. The second major reason why it makes sense to involve the judiciary are an attempt to avoid separation of powers concerns. So that's the, the short outline of my main proposal. The counter arguments, of course, are many. Few of them that I'll touch on just briefly before we have a bit of time for comments and question and answer. The four that I'll touch on have to do with chilling effects, financial costs, independence and separation of powers concerns, and congressional inertia. The first, <laughs> chilling effects. This is, I think, in my mind, perhaps the most significant um, or weighty objection that could be made against a move to public ownership and subsequent disclosure of judicial papers. The concern is that maybe regulation along these lines would actually have the perverse effect of having judges commit less to writing in their attempt to evade public disclosure of what they have written. Concerns along these lines were raised um, during the commission's hearings and investigation in the 1970s. For example, Judge Lombard, who was one of the members of that 17-member federal commission, noted, any feeling that a judge has to preserve anything that may be committed to paper is simply going to drive the judges not to commit things to paper, but simply to handle the matters by word of mouth or telephone. These sorts of concerns in my mind are really very legitimate, but I don't think that they are insurmountable. For one thing, I think that appropriate time lags, appropriate time restrictions could go a long way to assuring judges that judicial records will not be disclosed prematurely and hence to help alleviate these sorts of chilling effect concerns. If judges know with certainty that their records will not be disclosed for some specified period of time, then they shouldn't be overly concerned about committing matters to writing. In fact, such a regime would actually arguably be preferable to our current ad hoc system where judges' inter interchambers communications can be disclosed almost immediately, as we saw, for example, in the disclosure of Marshall's papers. It's also, I think, um, reassuring to note that the current system of private ownership, which allows judges to decide whether or not to release inter and um, interchambers and interjudge communications, has not stopped judges from communicating with each other currently in a frank and candid manner. In our current system of private ownership, where we allow almost immediate release of judges' papers, we see that judges continue to release papers, and hence, if they knew that there was a longer time lag, it seems that they would continue to create papers. Even with respect to judges' completely internal chamber's records that the judge never shares with other judges, and hence that the judge can currently decide not to disclose, it seems unlikely that judges would stop engaging in those sorts of communications, largely out of necessity. They would need to continue to do so. For example, iterations of drafts between law clerk and judge in chambers would likely continue on. There's also perhaps another reason why judges would likely continue, despite this chilling effect, which is that judges or justices often might prefer history to be told through their own eyes rather than through the eyes of others. One historian tried to convince Berger of this when this historian would continually see Berger in the halls and would say, hey, you better not burn those papers like he was threatening to do because you don't want history to be told from the po point of view of Brennan, do you? <laughs> so there could be perhaps a self-serving reason for an individual judge or justice to want to preserve his or her own papers. So I don't find them insurmountable, but I do find them significant, the chilling effects. Financial costs, this is certainly another counter argument to be considered. It would be quite expensive if our country invested in retaining judicial papers, particularly in this electronic era, electronic era where we have more and more and more electronic records as well as hard copy records. The operating budget for the Presidential Library alone in, in fiscal year 28 was more than $63 million, just to give you, you know, a data point for what we spend on records retention in our country. With respect to judicial records, how much financial investment would be required, I think, would depend on the specifics. For example, do we involve private repositories as well as public? If we were to allow these papers to be deposited in private repositories, then particularly with respect to at least the papers of Supreme Court justices, I think there are many private repositories that would be willing to shoulder the financial burden um, to a great degree. The third major counterargument: judicial independence and separation of powers concerns. On its face, these sorts of concerns, I think, seem quite appealing. The judiciary is the branch that would be most impacted, so let it regulate on its own. Also, why risk a potential confrontation between Congress and the courts, rather than just letting the judiciary take a crack at this on its own in the first place? The main problem with just saying, let the courts do it, wait, wait, Congress stay out, let the courts do it, is that 
the judiciary has had lots of time to take action, and it has taken none. This ad hoc system has persisted throughout the years. This is despite Congress clearly inviting the judiciary to step up and take action in the wake of the release of Justice Marshall's papers when Congress held a hearing on the topic and openly invited the judiciary to step up and to try to regulate in this area. So if the judiciary is left on its own to regulate, I think it's quite likely no uniform rules will develop and will consider will continue in our ad hoc system. Moreover, even if the judiciary did try to regulate without some kind of congressional prodding, its rules would likely lack the force and effect of law, given that the judiciary, it would seem, would likely lack the power to turn what is currently private, pay, private property into public property. Congressional inertia, the last major counterargument that I wanted to just touch briefly on today, that of course can, can apply with respect to any number of substantive areas today. It's not a reason not to try to get something done, right? Um, but with respect to judges' papers, I think it does have particular force because it seems that Congress would be particularly unlikely to want to act with respect to judges' papers when it hasn't acted with respect to its own papers either. Much like judges' papers, our country's history of congressional papers has really not been given treatment by legislators, by Congress itself, or um, by scholars. And so if Congress were to regulate judges' papers, it seems that it would probably be forced to take some action with respect to its own papers, and that may not be something that Congress would likely want to do. So that, I think, is another reason why we may well never see regulation of judges' papers, even though it's something that I believe is a normative matter, would be highly desirable. So that sums up my argument. I do hope that I finished my job of talking before you finished your own job of listening. And I would ha be happy to answer any questions or field comments that those of you in the audience might have. There was one back there first. Yeah? Well, I think you touched on it, but in your view, would the pr preservation would be both the physical papers and electronic. Yes. Here we go. Yes, I think it, 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 it would be fruitless to say we only do hard copy in today's era. So you would have to go to electronic as well. And there are some examples. Um, judge Arnold was a judge, a court of appeals judge, who did turn over his electronic records as well as his hard copy records. And a historian was able to turn a, an amazing book out of that. So there are examples of, of electronic records being preserved and that being something that was searchable. It certainly raises new technological challenges and tasks. Um, but on the other hand, you know, maybe it makes it a bit more doable because we don't have to have these warehouses full of papers. We don't have to invest in physical space. We still have to invest in significant technological backbone. Yeah. And there was a question there. I find this very fascinating, not only for people's property, but also IP. And as the first started to speak, in my mind, the movie we went to the intellectual property, mm -hmm. just talking about the physical expression, talking about the physical papers. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the only way to exercise any form of control over that, that master copy. Right? Yeah. Um, which was an interesting question. Yeah, there's a really strange disconnect, isn't there, that we say that these are private property, and yet under copyright law, as it's been explained to me by others who practice in the field, that um, these are governmental works. So under copyright law, we view it as, as a governmental work, and that definitely presents a strange disconnect. We thought through that again in writing the book that I told you about, because we have all these papers, and as we're getting our permissions for the various articles, <gasps> the panic struck that, wait a minute, do we have to get permission to be reproducing these, and because it was a governmental work, we were fine, but yet inside I struggled with that because it's their private property. It's quite odd. Yeah. Uh, do, do your arguments filter all the way down to the federal district court level and also perhaps the state Supreme Court level? Yeah. So they do filter down to all levels of the federal judiciary. So I think within that, if the judiciary is going to take a look at it, it needs to look at bankruptcy courts. It needs to look at you know all of its different courts. But that doesn't mean, in my mind, that different rules might not be set. I think there should be uniformity within the courts. All bankruptcy courts should be treated the same, all federal district courts, all court of appeals. But it might be that the judiciary decides, 
perhaps because the records are so different at each different level that what needs to be retained is quite different at each level. As to state courts, I think that's something that has to be state by state because, for example, separation of powers concerns, other concerns can be quite different on the state level. I did do some research when I started this project to see are there any states that have handled this well. And I learned that most states, like the federal government, haven't thought about it, although there are a few places where the statutes um, speak in a way that makes it sound as if they did have an awareness of this and um, do speak of them in a, in a public notion. That's the rarity. That's rare, though. Yeah, yes, um, that is something I've thought about and it's something the commission, the study from 1977 that I told you about thought about. One of the things they thought about is should we put this into FOIA? Where in FOIA we've got you know, various exceptions that have been built in um, and in, um, in Congress's ultimate decision to pass the Presidential Records Act, they didn't go with that complete model. They kind of layered the PRA on top of FOIA, but one exception that comes up in that context all the time is presidential privilege, for example. How should that apply? Should a time lag be enough to address those sorts of concerns? If we say, do, do we say that judicial privilege or presidential privilege disappears after 15 years or after 20 years, um, and that as long as we protect it for that much time, we don't have to worry about it? I think I would be inclined that for many of those concerns, if we have a robust enough time lapse, we can protect many of the judiciary's institutional interests, but with respect to individuals' interests, we probably have very different calculations. And I think there we probably could simply borrow from many rules that already exist about, say, um, um, some kind of trade secrets, right, that, might, that courts can't divulge to others. I, we already have many rules that help dictate what can and can't be disclosed, and we probably could borrow, on many, borrow from many of those rules rather than having to completely reinvent the wheel. Or I guess I should say, the courts could borrow from any of those. Because I, I do want to stress, I'm not suggesting we cram something down their throats. For compliance sake, we have to have them come up with these rules on their own in the end. Yeah, and, and that's enforceability, compliance is, is, is key, right? But it also is extremely difficult to enforce. My own sense is that if something were on the books, if the judiciary buys in and writes these regs on their own, there aren't very many judges who are going to openly flout them. That judges tend to be rule followers. And if there is something that the judiciary as a whole has bought into and has promulgated, I think most will comply. Now, that's not to say that all will, but I think most will comply. Yeah. Yeah. Do I think law clerks should have some notion that what they have done is protected, is essentially your question, and no, I don't. But partly that is because Justice Stevens, I think, made it quite clear to us when we arrived, you know, you are, you are a public servant, you are, you are helping me, a justice, carry out my duty, and you are doing work for the government while you were here, and everything that you write may someday be out there for history. I mean, that was quite clear to us. That was not a secret to me. Um, so every memo that I wrote, I, I wrote carefully, not because I was afraid, but because I knew that this is the governmental job and you need to take your job extremely seriously and others besides just your boss may read this someday. So I actually think that's a very beneficial effect because it causes you, I think, to do a careful job. Yeah. Elena Kagan's not the other one where we saw this come up recently, right? Former clerk during her confirmation proceedings, her papers, some of her papers she'd written came back to not haunt her quite the same way that that one memo haunted Rehnquist, but cause her some difficulty. Yeah. Uh, so you brought up the financial cost thing. I think you make an excellent argument that scholarly and important review mm -hmm. may be implying the way that these records are kept. Do you think that you could make an argument to offset the financial costs that this would improve the practice of law before these courts because there would be a greater aspect of uh, you know, goings on behind the work of the federal court judges? It's interesting to think about whether it would improve 
So your question is, would it actually improve access to courts in terms of leveling the playing field of people's knowledge of courts? Is that, is that how you're framing it? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think it, it, certainly it's going to improve our overall historical knowledge of the court. But on a day-to-day, -day, would it help litigant A today? Probably not because of the time lag, other than just generally understanding, for example, when you go up and petition for cert by, for the Supreme Court, knowing what you're up against, knowing what that means. That would help a litigant. But the specifics of how they're going to approach issue A today, if we have a significant enough of a time lag, that's not going to really help litigant A today. Right? It might help us down the road. And then it does raise interesting questions if it comes up down the road, if down the road we can figure out exactly what they meant in this paragraph or in this one phrase. Think of all your law school classes, those of you that are students in the room, and how much time you spend sometimes parsing one sentence in a Supreme Court opinion. What if we could find a treasure trove of information in the judge's papers that told us exactly what that meant? Well, is it like legislative history? Is it judicial history that you could then use in subsequent litigation way down the road to explain what they meant by that one phrase? Um, that's something actually somebody else did write an interesting article about that raises a lot of other interesting questions. I have not heard. I, I have not heard. Now, that doesn't mean that I missed it. I did try to do some comparative research on what happened in other countries. And much like in our own country, generally what I got back is people haven't really thought about it. But I would love to hear from any of you know that know, as to Britain in particular, that have heard. Yeah. So thank you so much, Kat, Professor Watts. So thank you so much for coming. I also uh, want to thank Sandy Grafe for helping us organize this event. And also, um, as Professor Watts mentioned, uh, Walters Kluwer for their generous sponsorship. Please join us. As I said, we have a reception in our reception room. Just sort of keep going to the left outside of this room, and you'll find your way there. And thank you so much again for coming.